Ryan Fairchild. Thanks for coming with for us today. Tell us a little about it yourself. What do you do? What kind of person are you? <laughs> well, we're going to go that far, huh? Yeah. Um, so I'll start <laughs> with what I do for work um, before we get into some of the other stuff. But I'm an attorney and I do about 50% of my work with content creators, esports players, and other things in the esports and video gaming space. So um, you know, I've seen virtually everything except for deals with publishers, um, except when it comes to like league rules or things like that that come sort of into the, the player side. Uh, and I have only done a little bit of tournament organizing work. But outside of that, I mean, I've worked with some teams. I've worked with ancillary services. Uh, I've worked with physical therapists in the space. Um, so virtually anything else that has come up in the esports space, I've worked with it at least a little bit. That sounds awesome. So that so that's what you do for work. So the next question is going to be about gaming, but I'd like to say, you know, as an attorney, I would also like to add not just what games do you play, but like how much gaming do you actually do? Because, you know, <laughs> being a lawyer takes a lot of time. Yeah. So uh, less than I used to, that's for sure. And actually, so th this kind of helps to do a little bit of the background. When I was in law school, Dota 2 came out and I had not played the original Dota. But I had friends who were like, you need to come play Dota 2. And I, I tried and I was like, this is an incredibly complex game. I don't think I have enough time to learn this. And they, they sent me a guide. I got more into it. Uh, my wife complained a lot about how little I was sleeping uh, because you had to do law school. You had to, you know, I had a kid at the time. Um, but I absolutely loved Dota. And of course, I, you know, I played games going back to the original brick Game Boy, the little green screen Game Boy back in the day um, and had worked in a mini golf arcade place. And so eventually, though, watching more esports is what led to all of this. Actually, Dota 2 is what led to this because there was a guy named Will Pardon who was doing a PhD at Chapel Hill. I met up with him. We became friends. And he was my foray into the industry when I became a lawyer. So currently, I've actually gotten, as I say, off the sauce. I don't play Dota anymore. Um, but I have been playing a lot of Hades recently and Hollow Knight and a little bit of League of Legends with friends because I will never ever take League of Legends as seriously as I did Dota so I can play that safely. Well, League of Legends is like Dota light, so you're, you're good there. <laughs> ah, one of my people. Yeah, we, there we go. Well, no, I'm actually hardcore League of Legends, as you can see, oh. Ash, you're back here. Oh, yeah. But uh, but I will accept that Dota is more complicated. <laughs> yeah, well, it's kind of nice. I don't have to think about denying creeps. I don't have to think about you know lane blocking, all that stuff. Although there, there is still a lot of complexity in that game. I mean, definitely, extra definitely. objectives and things going on that I'm still barely scratching the surface and hopefully we'll never fully scratch the surface or I'll probably be back into it just as deeply as Dota. Well, is that a bad thing? <laughs> yeah, the answer is well, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Again, with the kids and the law practice and keeping my wife happy, uh, I cannot play as many video games as I used to. All right. Just play League, just one. <laughs> just just one. Only yeah. one. It won't hurt, right? Yeah, exactly. One and done. <laughs> Sound like my friends in law school, actually. <laughs> so speaking of law school again, you said you were like pretty hardcore gamer back then. And this is honestly me just trying to transition to this next question. What what made you try to become a lawyer? Because there's a lot of jobs out there, and lawyer is one of the harder ones. It takes a lot of college prep then law school then getting into the field what what made you choose lawyer yeah so i have always been very interested in kind of how society works its functionings its gears things like that and i was very interested and still am interested in criminal justice reform um, i get to do a little bit of that uh, in the other 50 percent of work i do uh, i do some work in the federal court system and uh, have taken on pro bono protester cases with the recent uh, BLM protests. But uh, that's really what drove me towards the law was I, I was very interested in justice from a young age. Uh, read a, I mean, I was, I was doing book reports on the FBI COINTELPRO papers back in high school and issues like that. And so I, I've always had sort of a a steer towards the law. I did look at a couple of other things, but it's been on a pretty strong track for that for quite a while. So that's what drew me in. Um, and I think I still, that, that's one of the reasons I was interested in player side work in particular is I, I saw a lot of players being taken advantage of. Um, I saw that players associations weren't really a thing that had been formed yet in esports. And so when I started doing this uh, a little over three years ago, that was 
um, the primary interest I had was working on the player side to help better develop the industry from that front. That's that sounds uh, actually like it's very, very needed. I, I definitely agree with you. I think it's not just players, but really any kind of talent in the industry, whether you know it's uh, shoutcasters or hosts or gamers or really anybody in the industry uh, that's talent is usually on the younger side and they're not really familiar with um, the the rights that they have, but also negotiating contracts or anything like that. So we definitely, definitely need help from people like you. So. That being said, what does a typical day for you look like? Because you said you've interacted with so many different people, right? So what what is a typical esports attorney day like? Like what what is it that you do? Yeah, no, that's an excellent question. And actually before I jump into that, I want to go back to that point you made about like talent and the issues they face. A lot of people don't know this, but wage theft is the single biggest category of theft. Like you know, we usually think of bank robberies, you think of sort of the big anecdotes of what constitutes theft, assault and robbery, things like that. But wage theft is the single biggest category. And players face that all the time. Talent faces that all the time. Uh, there are just some recent tweets involving, uh, I think, a, a tournament with Valorant with Pulse Arena, where there were allegations coming out that uh, talent had not been paid yet uh, for something that happened a while ago. And you run into that all the time because you have this sort of trade-off of, well, is it worth it to sue? And so a lot of employers know they're probably not gonna sue us and there's no, you know, litigation is expensive and prohibitive and small claims court is still even hard to jump through, especially when you have an internet, international space like ours, where you have talent who might be in the UK and then an event that might be in Southeast Asia, um, you know, trying to follow up on those remedies can be difficult. So just again, to your point, uh, it's important to, I think, build up these institutional bodies and professionalization to, to help with that. But as to your question about the day-to-day, -day, let me actually go peek because I just did some weekly planning. So without <laughs> let's getting take into, a look at your calendar. <laughs> yeah, without getting into details of what exactly it is, on Monday, I will be reviewing two different uh, player agreements. The That's going to be about half the day. The other half of the day is going to be dealing with litigation issues. Uh, in the evening, I have a meeting. I'm part of the Esports Bar Association. I'm the, one of the editors in chief of the journal. And we're so, sort of doing a breakdown of this last year and what we're going to do going into next year. Um, and then later on, those are the big esports things I have. Uh, no, I've got some trademark work. I'm working on a licensing agreement uh, for an apparel line for a content creator. Uh, what else have I been doing this week? Worked on a Twitch deal this week and should have another one of those coming up soon. So, you know, licensing deals, play, player agreements all the time, licensing deals, platform streaming deals, uh, that's the typical work. You get a smattering here and there of sort of the pre-litigation. Um, I've come close to having to file a lawsuit in esports, but have never actually had to do it. We've been able to resolve things amicably before litigation, which is always in my mind, a win for the client and everybody else because litigation is not fun uh, for anybody. Um, you know, I, I enjoy it from the academic perspective. I don't enjoy it from the stress and hassle for the client perspective. So that's kind that, of a snapshot of some of the things I do day to day. That def yeah, the, the litigation is definitely stressful. Um, I, just a follow up uh, to, to what you said, because I'm curious, you know, a lot of times it, law practice is very segmented. Like, okay, I do criminal defense or I do IP or I do this. And you just listed like four things. You do litigation, you do, you know, labor law, contract, uh, IP. What is your educational background? Like, did you, did you, you know, obviously lawyers don't have to pick a focus in law school, but they can. So did you pick a focus? And do you have any uh, recommendations for anybody who is either going through law school or as a lawyer looking to switch careers in terms of, is there anything that they should focus on if they'd like to jump into esports law? Yeah, no, that's an excellent question. I went geared towards litigation in particular. Um, you know, I did a clerkship for a federal judge coming out of law school. Like I was very much in that track of doing litigation. I came to a law firm though, where there are a lot of generalists here. Um, although they joke that any litigator is a generalist, um, just because you could come across any problem that you'd have to deal with. So I, you know, I, entertainment law, a lot of people don't know this. Entertainment law isn't really necessarily a specific area of law. It's a very broad practice generally. So you will, I mean, intellectual property law. Uh, labor law, contracts, you definitely want to have at least those three 
in your you know sort of repertoire take those classes um and and in law school to be honest i did not take those i took a cyberspace class and a privacy law class and those were kind of the closest i got to this world but you know i was taking classes i just thought were fun so i took like a national security law class as well um so do take i mean absolutely take copyright um, or something that has a good amount of copyright um, i am hoping actually to be an adjunct professor uh, at a university coming up maybe next year. Um, and we're gonna teach video game and esports law. And you don't have to necessarily take those things beforehand because we're gonna sort of cover that, but you should definitely be taking that somewhere if you're going to be taking that class, if you're going to be working towards video games and esports. Um, if you're gonna be on the player side, you definitely wanna know some labor law. Um, you probably wanna know that on the team side as well and in other places, um, especially with, and keep an eye on California, AB5 and the Dynamex decision have really sort of shifted that. Um, and we're seeing that with um, Uber and some of those other gig economy. Uh, those rules also have a big impact on esports as well. Um, beyond that, I mean, you wanna know, you wanna have some passing familiarity with like the Talent Agency Act in California, uh, you know, get, get some color there. Trademarks is always helpful, although you can kind of pick those up on the fly. And let me be clear, like I picked up a lot of this stuff like by working with other attorneys who do it and saying, here's this new area I'm working in, what do we do about this? And they're like, hey, this is really interesting. Let's go figure this out. Um, so I've had to do a lot of learning up. People can get ahead by, by doing those things. Is there another component to your question or did I answer all of that? That's I, yeah, I was just curious because yeah, like I was saying, uh, the rest of legal spaces are very uh, specialized, right? And yours is very general. So yeah, yeah. definitely recommendations on, on those uh, classes to take in law school were good. Well, and one other thing to add to that, um, the law, the more you see it, the law, the more it all kind of fits together. And so if you can have a broad base, especially going into video games and esports, I think it's very helpful. You'll start to see, I mean, you know, I came at contracts from a litigator's perspective, which is basically what is every way that this could blow up and a lawsuit could arise. And it's actually a very helpful perspective to have. Um, and it's helpful when you're negotiating and they're like, why does this matter? And I'm like, well, suppose that some giant company acquires you and you're like, oh no, we do this all with handshake deals and big company acquires you. And they're like, we're gonna exercise all of our rights under this contract. Like suddenly it becomes an issue. So, right. yeah. I want it in writing. Yeah. That's what I always say. <laughs> well, and and I, I tell this to people a lot. Um, you know, this is, one of the, take it for what it's worth. Uh, if it's going to protect you, get it in writing. If it's going to hurt you, do it over the phone. Um, like, you know, don't, I'm not, yep. not doing any better call Saul here stuff, but you know, just <laughs> you pay for everything that you want to make sure is protecting you. All right. Now I've got two questions for you. One of them is just, you said you're going to be a professor soon at a college. Which one? <laughs> well, let me say um, that's still in progress. So I, I can't say for sure. And it would just be an adjunct position. It would just be sort of when you have people come from outside and work on that for a little bit. So okay. it's in the, the statement works. stands. Yeah. When, when it's out, when, when it's out, when I can be public about it and it's confirmed that there's going to be a class, I will definitely let people know. Okay. I'm just very curious on that one. <laughs> and secondly, this is a kind of a two-parter. One, what is the most common issue you work with? And two, if you can tell us, what is the biggest job you've worked on? Because you did say you've never gone to a full-blown lawsuit. But yeah. I, I am curious to just hear, what is the biggest job you've gotten to? Oh, biggest in terms of what? In terms of just, you felt like it was at the highest up the food chain of big law practice. I don't know how to word this properly. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I've, because it, it could be it could be big in different ways, right? As yeah. in, like in terms of hours spent, it could be like a small contract dispute that you know you spent a year uh, on versus let's say <laughs> the biggest company you've had to work with, if you can disclose that. Oh, gosh. If not, then the most hours. Well, I mean, you know, working on player deals, you're regularly opposite, um, you know, the the well-known teams in the space. I mean, look at you know, those teams that sh just showed up on the Forbes valuation list, you know, you're regularly negotiating opposite them. Um, and it tends to be sort of a smaller subset of them, right? Like they have all sorts of verticals and branches to go off of that. But, you know, I've worked on seven player or seven figure deals um, for players and or content creators. 
Um, and the goal there is, again, like the goal isn't necessarily big in terms of hours. It's making sure that sort of the client is taken care of and protected and knows what they're getting into. Um, so some of those don't necessarily take a lot of time in terms of hours. It's a review, it's advice, it's doing red lines to clean up the contract. It's some back and forth negotiations. Um, but, you know, most of the deals I work on in terms of hours don't take particularly long. Um, the, the biggest thing I've had to work on uh, in terms of hours was helping to spin up a startup, uh, do their securities work, um, you know, get them sort of off and running with their fundraising. Uh, and that was one of the bigger ventures. And then, you know, some of the, some of the teams, um, I, I only work with a handful of teams and that work has sort of gotten quiet as I've continued to move more and more towards player work, in fact, um, is uh, helping them as well with like benefits plans, stock incentive plans, things like that too, just to help them do that right. That stuff is very careful and intensive. And I usually touch only parts of it. We have other people who do a lot more work in that um, to the point about it being sort of more segmented. We have some people who are very uh, specialized and good at what they do on the um, employee benefits side and the stock incentive side. So, you know, a lot, when those bigger things come in, I pull in a number of other people, the player contracts, content creator contracts. I basically just do those by myself. Okay. So, so speaking of, of players and, and content creators, what advice do you have for either uh, players hoping to go pro or, or talent essentially getting into the space? What advice do you have for them in terms of protecting themselves? Um, is there kind of like, you know, here are three tips when looking at a contract or, you know, maybe one of those tips is ask for a contract as opposed to a handshake. Yeah, well, a couple of things there. Um, I think the best advice I can give is more practical than legal, which is vet people. Um, a good organization can save you from a bad contract, but a good contract will not save you from a bad organization. Um, so, you know, talk to people who have worked with that team before, former players, current players, try to find out how well they treat their talent, how well they treat their players. Um, you know, that's, that's the biggest piece of advice. Second, I mean, you really, if, if the contract's paying you over a threshold amount where getting a lawyer or a good agent, um, you know, good lawyer or good agent um, is going to provide value to make sure that you're protected um, you know, reviews don't take particularly long, especially, you know, I've seen enough contracts at this point that they take two to maybe three hours, depending on the length of the contract. Um, you know, for most people, that's money. Think of it like insurance, right? It's sort of like you pay insurance to avoid issues and you sort of do the same thing with an attorney to hopefully avoid issues or at least understand the risk that you're taking on. So I think getting representation is actually really, really important. Um, in terms of contracts, things, the biggest things to look out for are... Uh, and, and, you know, it's going to depend on the person, but to me generally is look at what sort of rights you are giving away to your likeness, image, and work product. Like, are they going to own all of your streaming and YouTube content? Like that's, that's a thing that can happen. Um, you know, the horror stories of owning your likeness and image in perpetuity uh, exclusively, uh, those largely have gone by the wayside, but you want to know if you're giving up those rights as well. Uh, the other thing I would say that is really important, a lot of players think, oh, I'm entering into a one-year agreement or a two-year agreement or a three-year agreement. Look at how easily the team can terminate you because a lot of those contracts, they can terminate you without cause, two weeks notice, two weeks pay, one month's notice, one month's pay. So really the length of your contract could be far shorter depending on what's in there. So uh, looking at how they can terminate you for cause is another big thing as well. Uh, look at what sort of warranties and representations you're making, because those are things you're saying that are true. And typically those come accompanied by an indemnification provision saying that if the team gets sued because something you said in here is false or because you breached provision, then you have to pay for the team's damages. So, you know, the other thing too, uh, we, we haven't talked about this, but the Tifu phase lawsuit settled, you know, a couple months back but a lot of players don't think about where they would have to litigate if they do get into a fight with the team. So Tifu, you know, wanted to go sue in California and take advantage of the Talent Agency Act. We never got a decision to know if it would have applied, um, but there was a choice of law and venue provision in New York. 
And so FaZe filed a lawsuit in New York and suddenly instead of litigating in California, he has to go litigate in New York and got some unfavorable rulings. I don't know that he would have gotten better rulings in California, but we never really got a chance to find out. So, you know, thinking about some of that minutia, like I tell every player when I see their contract, look, if there is a fight and you have to sue, this is where you're going to go. So think about that. That makes okay. sense. That makes sense. So number number one, a piece of advice, talk to a lawyer. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. speaking of that, how, how would a player or the talent go about finding an esports lawyer? It, because, you know, I you know, I'm in the legal field and I don't know if I know any esports lawyers off the top of my head and somebody who's not even in the legal practice, you know, it, it's it's a, still a growing field. So what's the best way to go about finding a, a, an esports lawyer? Well, um, there really are only a handful of those who are in this space so far who really know what they're doing. So, you know, you can, and, and honestly, you don't have to go with me, but if you want to ask me about other lawyers, who are out there, I'm happy to talk to you about what I've heard or my thoughts on them. Um, and, you know, it's expanding rapidly. So I've tried to find more and more people over in the EU, for example, because you know, the most I can do is sort of a red flag review, but I have to tell players if they're going over there, look, I don't know Danish law, I don't know British law, things like that. It's better to get you an attorney in that jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. um, so the best ways to find them, I mean, honestly, like, don't just go Google it, like ask other people around and vet again. Like I said earlier, the biggest thing you can do with a team is to vet them. Same thing with any professional you work with. So if you hear about an attorney, go ask other people about them. There are a lot of people who, you know, this is one of the things in the entertainment industry. I've got, uh, um, I've, I've worked with people who work a lot in the, the traditional entertainment side. And they say some of the biggest names you hear for the attorneys are not the best attorneys. They're just the best connected. So you still wanna know what sort of work product are you gonna get? What sort of advice are you gonna get? Um, and so vetting them as well is really, really important. All right, I got one last question before we wrap up and it's about the future of esports law. You've been working on quite a few stuff. You told us about your schedule for this coming week. So you should have a better view of this than I do at least. What kind of legal issues do you think are going to be on the horizon for the gaming industry and esports? Like what ones are coming up more often nowadays? Yeah, well, the clearest one right now is the RIAA dispute with uh, Twitch and the DMCA takedowns. And that's a combination of issues, right? Like there's a lack of tools to sort of deal with those issues. But I think DMCA and copyright, I mean, listen, like the fundamental difference between like traditional sports and esports is that the publisher owns the game and they can shut it down anytime they want. And so copyright is like the, you know, primordial moving factor of all of esports. And so keeping an eye on anything around copyright is going to be really, really important um, because right now publishers, you know, they're really the ones controlling the spigot for all of content creation and esports. Um, I think players associations and players unions are something to keep an eye on. Same with, I think, you know, content creators with some of the issues they face should be thinking about that as well. Um, beyond that, I think what we're really going to see is what's sort of coming next. So VTubers are sort of on the rise. Um, I still sort of think VTubing is just bizarre and, and, and different, but you're going to continue to see like sort of new forms of entertainment pop up. And that's going to be sort of where we're pushing the edges on the law. Um, the law always lags behind technology. I mean, just by decades. But, yeah. By decades, by its nature. So the DMCA is like what, 20 years old now, 22 years, something like that. Um, and it just was not made for our modern world of streaming and you know, the content creation that's out there now. And so, um, you know, trying to figure that out and what the mouse is going to do, as it were, what Disney is going to do uh, with copyright, um, you know, that's that's still the place to watch. I always tell people that, you know, for esports to fully monetize, it's going to be um, somewhere between, you know, publishers really being benevolent dictators with the games that they have and a sea change in copyright law. And I don't see either of those necessarily happening anytime soon. Some publishers are definitely better than others, but it's, it's tough space out there. So, you know, you saw um, Melee having tournaments shut down, Smash uh, getting shut down recently, and that's all based on copyright law. 
So classic Nintendo. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you very much for coming out here today. I got a lot out of this. I learned a lot more than I thought I would. Yeah, well, happy to be here. It was definitely very interesting. Thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, yes. for sure. And thank you, everyone that is watching the stream today. If you would like to, you can feel free to donate to our charity today, Extra Life, and enter yourself into one of our prize drawings that will be happening later. We are going to have a short break and then roll straight into another music break with Progress Culture. And I look forward to seeing you all there. <laughs>